dumb things Christians believe. You must really, truly, genuinely repent or believe. I very rarely find grace believers doing this, yet I find legalists doing this all the time. You can't just believe. You have to really, really believe. And if you're truly saved, if you really believe, if you have genuinely repented, you will have a changed life. And the basic idea is that if you're not living your life as obediently or godly as the preacher who is saying this, who bases his standards on his own opinions about himself... You haven't genuinely repented, because of course by that they mean repent of your sins. Or you don't truly believe in Christ. I have a special term for this, and I use it to name a common symptom of Lordship Spectrum Disorder. Adverb abnauseum. Using excessive adverbs to the point of its becoming so nauseating that I am sick of it. Now some of you might be thinking that there is barely a Christian preacher on this planet who doesn't say stuff like this. It's normal Christian preaching, so who does this so-called no-nonsense Christianity moron think he is, sitting there in his room calling these great men of God dumb? Well, the reason why it's rather ridiculous is because of the noticeable lack of Bible verses, particularly in relation to the gospel preaching passages where these adverbs are used. All we have to do is use a concordance to search for when the word believe or believed or believeth is used or the word repent, repented or repenteth is used to test when these adverbs are used. For example, John's Gospel has verse after verse after verse telling you to believe. John's Gospel uses the word believe to a very excessive degree and yet you won't find John's Gospel saying truly believe or genuinely believe or really believe. He just says believe. You say, well, that's just John's gospel. Well, okay, how about the other gospels? They don't say truly repent or genuinely believe the gospel, whether we look at Matthew or Mark or Luke. In fact, there are multitudes of verses that qualify. Just look at this slide on the screen. I have counted 200 verses that say repent or believe or believe not or repented not without adding truly, really, genuinely or any such adverbs. Now, maybe there's the odd verse that says may believe that I've accidentally included, even though I've tried to filter those out. But frankly, this task was so easy, I wasn't even concentrating properly. And I ran out of room on the screen, as you can see there. And I didn't even include the nouns, repentance or belief or faith. And there's probably a few verses that I've missed out accidentally. If we brought in those verses and I carried on going, we could probably push this list beyond 250. So we have 200 to 250 verses saying believe or repent, and it's just a simple dichotomy. You either believe or you don't. So where is this truly, really, genuinely nonsense coming from? Well, they're basically attempting to gaslight your faith in the gospel. But what might these legalists say when you point this stuff out to them? Well, the reason why we say that is because if there are two choices, believe and believe not, then if you don't genuinely believe, you are just saying you believe, but you don't really believe. <laughs> Mark, if a man says there's faith and has not worked, James 2, James 2, James 2, James 2, Mark, Mark. Okay, then in that case, let's just blot out these 200 and something verses then because of James 2, which these parrots are wrong about anyway, but whatever. The problem is with this James 2 parroting is that everybody who invokes it does so in exclusion to most other Christians who also invoke James 2. For example, Roman Catholics love to parrot James 2 to justify that a true, saving, living, active, divine, real, genuine faith will produce works. But Protestants are not part of the one true church, so all of their good works don't prove that they truly, actively, divinely, really, genuinely believe. Protestants love to parrot James 2 to justify that naturally good fruits will flow from a true, saving, living, active, divine, real, genuine faith. But Catholics follow all kinds of unbiblical nonsense, so all of their good works don't prove that they truly, actively, divinely, really, genuinely believe. Jehovah's Witnesses love to parrot James 2 to justify that a true, saving, living, active, divine, real, genuine faith must have works. But all of these other apostate Christians are doing and believing so many wrong things that their good works don't prove that they truly, actively, divinely, really, genuinely believe. Even in Matthew 7, Jesus describes that there will be people saying, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And yet Jesus will say unto them, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Their many wonderful works did not prove that they truly, actively, divinely, really, genuinely believed. Also, you could go to Matthew 25 to read the illustration of the sheep and the goats. The goats asked Jesus when they failed to do the works. Lord, when did we do this? When did we not do that? Jesus rebuked them for failing even the least important person. 
The sheep, on the other hand, ask Jesus when they ever did such works. Lord, when did we do these things that you are commending us for? Jesus commended them simply for helping the least important person. The goat's many works didn't prove that they genuinely believed, and the sheep's lack of works didn't prove they didn't truly believe. It's almost as if all of these Christians are saying, true, saving, genuine, living faith produces works that are as good as mine and believes everything that I believe. I am the standard. You have to be like me. You have to at least try. But don't listen to these greasy graces with their Jesus this and Jesus that. I am so sick of them constantly talking about Jesus. It's like they don't know that there's all these Bible verses about you too. This isn't a difficult conundrum to solve. I've handpicked a few helpful Bible passages that will tell us what a real, true, genuine, divine, God-breathed, spirit-inspired faith entails. According to Romans 10, if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. With the heart man believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whosoever shall believe on him shall not be ashamed. So according to Romans 10, true, genuine, real faith, living faith, is to believe that God has raised Jesus from the dead. Confession of that faith is confessing the Lord Jesus, or in other words, acknowledging that Jesus is the Christ, not making him the Lord of your life and submitting to his lordship, or any of those other meaningless Christianese riddles. But just so that we're not only using one passage, let's try another passage to tell us what this true, genuine, real faith is supposed to consist of. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul tells us what we have to hold in memory, otherwise we have believed in vain. And this gospel, he declares, is that by which you are saved. So it sounds like a good indicator of what a true, genuine, saving faith is. And Paul seems to be quite content with the death, burial and resurrection of Christ and the witnesses to his resurrection. Seems like you just have to have faith in what Jesus did to prove your genuine faith. And just in case any Judaizers are sitting there, well, that's Paul and he's a false apostle. Well, okay, let's just get some cross-verification from Jesus and a couple of the other apostles then. According to John 11, Jesus himself said, I am the resurrection and the life. Believe in me. Notice he didn't say, I am the power in you to overcome your sins. Believe in me. Or I am the one that worketh in you to do my works. Believest thou this? When John himself, as the author, told the reader to believe, he pointed out that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. These are facts about Jesus. Notice that he didn't say that you might surrender unto his lordship. In Acts 2.21, Peter said, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Notice he didn't say, Whosoever surrendereth his life and submit to the lordship of Christ might be saved. Of course, these work tars like to say that Acts chapter 2 is all about turning from your sins, but I've already demonstrated in my repentance series his preaching was about Jesus, not about you, so I'm not going to recover that old ground. But those are just facts about Jesus. Just because you believe the facts about Jesus doesn't mean that you're truly saved. Those facts are just the beginning of your faith. Now you have to do the works. Even the demons believe and tremble. Well, Jesus didn't actually die for demons, but your red herring is duly noted. As well as clear instructions we have just seen, a good mechanism we can use to test how new converts were fruit inspected is to see when they were baptised. Typically, in most cases, water baptism was performed fairly quickly after people believed or repented, so we can use those instances of baptism to see how the men of God did a fruit inspection to ensure that their converts had really, truly, genuinely repented and they were ready to be baptised. In Acts chapter 8, starting at verse 29, Philip met up with an Ethiopian eunuch who was reading scripture from Isaiah, but couldn't understand it. In response, Philip preached about Christ. And then in verse 36, passing by some water, the eunuch asked what hinders him from being baptised. So how did Philip respond? You need to fall down on your knees in true brokenness over your sins, and you need to make amends with all the people you've hurt in your life, and I want you to march right back to Ethiopia now, and come back here and show some fruit, and you better crawl back here in the dirt with some testimonies to prove that you are worthy to be baptised. Oh wait, that's not what Philip said. Philip just said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. Now, of course, this is where the really, truly, genuinely types will say, well, when Philip says believe with all your heart, you can't just say you believe. You need to really, really believe and genuinely surrender your will over to the Lordship of Christ. Well, if we just read what the verse says, the eunuch just said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I mean, it's fairly anticlimactic, really, isn't it? Notice how he just said he believed a fact about Jesus. He made no commitment to change his lifestyle. He made no emotional song and dance about surrendering everything to Jesus. He didn't get on his knees and cry or make pig squeals. He just said he believed a fact about Jesus. 
Now, of course, this is where the actually people distract you from the relevant issue that is being discussed to tell you that verse 37 shouldn't actually be in the Bible, so modern Bibles omit this verse. Well, let's just pretend for the sake of argument that verse 37 shouldn't be in the Bible. That means that there's even less fruit inspecting in the Satanic Work Salvation NIV and NLT than even in the King James Bible, so they've just shot themselves in the foot with that argument, haven't they? And earlier in the chapter, we had the story of Simon. You remember Simon, don't you? He was the sorcerer who bewitched people into thinking that he had great power of God. But when he believed, the writer of Acts doesn't seem to need to tell us about the big long list of life corrections he needed to make in order to be accepted into the faith and baptised. Maybe that did happen, but we'll never know. Acts chapter 16 with the story of the prison keeper is a little bit different because in this case he was trembling and fell on his knees. The Lordship has salivate over that bit. And he asked, what must he do to be saved? So obviously he understood that he needed saving from something. And Paul and Silas only told him to believe on the Lord. It didn't really get any more complicated than that. Now he did wash Paul and Silas' stripes before being baptised, but nothing too sensational and dramatic. When John the Baptist preached repentance, the people confessed their sins. They didn't throw all of their wineskins and naked statues onto a fire in his presence. As long as they confessed, it is assumed that he baptised them. In Acts chapter 2, which again is a passage talking about Jesus, but for some reason legalists think it's all about your behavioural correction, it says that those who gladly received his word were baptised. They were not first sent home to clean up their lives and then come back and bring forth fruits before Peter would baptise them. He just got on with it. Even when people weren't baptised after conversion, there were multiple examples of Jesus telling people to believe without a big long song and dance about how true belief does this, that and the other. John's Gospel contains multiple examples. I mean, it's so anticlimactic compared to what most of these Christians are saying. So there's more that I could say on that, but I'm sure you get the point. This really, truly, genuine nonsense exists for one reason. To preach work salvation. That's the reason. Well, if you really believe, you will do the works. And if you don't do the works, then you don't really believe. You don't have true repentance. Well, last time I checked, you can't really ascertain whether somebody believes that Jesus is the Christ by how many good works they do. There are lots of people who do good works, but don't believe that Jesus is the Christ. Or they believe that Jesus is the Christ, plus their good works count towards their salvation. Well, if your good works count towards your salvation, well, then Jesus is not the Christ. You're the Christ. You either believe that Jesus is the Christ or you believe that you're the Christ. Which one is it? Well, we are saved by grace through faith, but if you're truly saved, you'll produce the works, and if you don't do the works, you're not saved. Right, well then, it's not faith without works then, is it? It's faith that works, which, you'll never guess this, is faith and works. And if it's faith and works, it's not grace. Because grace and works for salvation are antithetical. If you need works to get into heaven, you don't believe that Jesus is the Christ. You think that you're the Christ. You give lip service to Jesus, but you're the Christ ultimately. The Bible told us over and over again to believe or repent without putting really, truly, genuinely in front of it, because the Bible uses simple terms. You either believe or you believe not. It's that simple. And when the Bible tests what you believe, it points to who Jesus is, what Jesus did. It doesn't point to you and all the things that you did. This is no-nonsense Christianity reminding you to be a no-nonsense Christian.